So the first thing is that I was, I was asked to speak about green tech. That's part of the, um, the, the background here is um, SMEs in the light of green technology. I think it's good to just have an idea of what we're talking about when we talk about green tech. It's a bit of an umbrella term anyway. Um, it relates to sustainable energy, uh, especially renewable energy generation that every South African is now dealing with. Um, if you don't know what a solar panel is at this stage, you have not been living in South Africa and you just flew in. Um, energy storage as well. Everyone knows about uh, bat battery storage at this point and about, um, about generators and things like that. Uh, it's also got related to energy conservation. Um, waste management and purification, and this includes things like upcycling that I think there's an example of in this very hall. Um, water purification, air purification, environmental remediation, and solid waste management. That's a huge mouthful. It's a huge topic to cover if you're going to start thinking about green technology and where you'd fit into the market. Now, with, with, the, with the, the idea of this green tech application in the back of our minds, we can start looking at intellectual property. As I said, I didn't want to give a speech where I just go through a dry recitation of every different form of intellectual property and all their various different types. This is all important stuff, obviously, but I think a lot of you have already heard this speech before. I've always been a proponent of the idea of intellectual property as a tool. Far too often, I feel that my profession has been guilty of this in the past. The response when somebody comes into our office to ask about intellectual property is, ah, file a patent. That's fine. Patents are great protection. That doesn't answer the question of what that intellectual property does for you and for your business. And I think we're going to work through an example and sort of start looking at some of the strategic concerns that business people should be applying to their intellectual property portfolios. And when I say portfolio, every one of you has an IP portfolio. If you've written anything on a piece of paper, if you've coded anything for a website, you have generated IP, um, mostly copyright, but there's also registered forms of IP, things like trademarks that most of you have had some sort of experience with, uh, things like patents that it sounds like uh, a fair number of you have also had experience with. And these are all part of the toolkit that you can use in your business to unlock value. That's how I like to think of intellectual property. So the approach that I like to take is a functional one. What is the underlying purpose of this form of IP? In other words, what is it supposed to do? How do I obtain protection? How do I go about getting these rights that, that IP provides? What sort of protection do I get? And crucially, what can I use it for? What are the strategies I can employ with the IP that I have? So, as a brief example, I'm just gonna go through two types of IP. As I say, there's actually a whole bunch. The, the, the ones that we'd normally talk about are patents, trademarks, copyright, registered designs. And then, you know, if there were any people in doing plants in the audience, I'd be talking about plant breeders rights, but I suspect that's not as relevant here. Um, you know, we've already, we're already down to four people who are really keen on the speech. I don't wanna make it one. Um, anyway, but to quickly, to quickly talk about some of the, the tool analogy with trademarks, everyone here deals with trademarks more or less. If you are working under a, if your business is working under a name, if you have an identity in the market, you're gonna start dealing with the trademarks as a common law right. But as I say, it is also a registered right. And the purpose of a trademark is to allow a customer to distinguish goods and services, to tell this set of goods and services, this set of service providers from another, because otherwise it would just be chaos and confusion. You can imagine that everyone would just go and they'd copy the, the, the get up and look and services of everyone else. So that's the purpose of a trademark is this differentiation. And in essence, for the, for the business person, it allows your reputation that you've worked so hard to establish that is now associated with your goods and services. It allows you to claim that and it allows you to keep your distinguishing features in a market. In terms of how it's obtained, as I said, can be by common law or by registration. I'm not gonna go through the entire process. I'd make my trademarks co colleagues cry if I try to talk about the ins and outs of trademarks anyway, because it's not what I deal with day to day. But basic, the basics, the gist of it is that if you go the registration route, you have to direct your trademark to a particular good or service. Uh, my favorite example, it's a very local example though, is that, you know, there's the Kit Kat, um, Kit Kat chocolate bars. There's also a Kit Kat moving service. And if you've ever wondered why Nestle doesn't sue the moving service, it's because they have trademarks in different, different classes of goods. Um, trademarks in South Africa have, if you do the application route, that application is actually examined by the registrar. The registrar goes and scrutinizes it, see, sees whether there are other marks, sees whether, whether the mark can actually be registered because there's certain exclusions to registration. And then if I say it rights obtained after grant, that's grant, 
but um, the rights are then obtained after grant and an opposition period. So the, the registrar, if they like your trademark, it gets granted and then there's an opposition period where people who are looking at the, um, at the, 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 the patent and trademark register can go and oppose it if they want. There we go. So having gone on to how, how you get them, what do you get for your trademark? Well, what you get is a right to use that mark in relation to the specific goods and services in the class that you have applied for. And there's, a, there's actually a secondary right that's encapsulated in other legislation where the owner can apply for seizure and destru destruction of counterfeit goods. So if you have, say, um, the, the classic one is things like Louis Vuitton handbags, you know, they, they, you can go to various different parts, um, various different parts of the country, including the center of town, and you can buy knockoff goods for various different products. And if you are a trademark owner, as opposed to the guy selling those products, you obviously don't want people diluting your brand by selling knockoff goods. So you can apply using your trademark to, um, to go and get these goods seized and destroyed in certain circumstances. Another caller. Um, the other thing about trademarks, which is wonderful for people in business, is that they have a 10-year term, but that term can be effectively renewed indefinitely so long as the mark is active and hasn't become generic. This means that a trademark, uh, this, 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 this distinguishing aspect of your business can live forever so long as you're keeping it fresh and present. So with all that said now, again, we're trying to focus on it as a tool. What's the use? Well, the use of trademarks is many and varied. I'm sure you can imagine what you can do with the ability to keep your, your branding distinct in the market. But the prime one, as I said, is to build brand identity, to build that customer association with your goods. Because customers associating positive emotions, experiences, positive outcomes that they get from using your products with your brand is basically just value. It's realized value. It's, 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 it's a sort of thing that barely needs selling. Um, and as I say, again, it helps to separate your product and services from competitors in the general crowd. It stops people from riding on your coattails when you're successful. They always say that the, um, the sign that you've got a successful business is that people want to steal it and ride on your identity. So that's trademarks. It's a fairly, fairly straightforward application, very important to people in business. You can, I'm sure you can all imagine the, the uses that you can put them to. Now we get to patents, which is more in my field and unfortunately is a lot more uh, niche, let's put it that way. Because the purpose of a patent is to protect a technical idea or concept. Um, unlike, as I said, unlike a trademark, which is directed to goods or services, patents are about a, a technical functional object that has an underlying concept that makes it novel and inventive. Now, in South Africa, we also have a slightly different patent regime to the rest of the world at the moment, um, uh, which I know the CRPC is actually moving to, to changing. Right now, we have what's called a depository system. So in South Africa, if you make your initial application, um, you, you go and file your provisional patent application, you then have 12 months in which to, to go and file your corresponding complete application and also corresponding applications in other jurisdictions. That it gets complex, but again, I don't wanna run you through the entire boring 101 lecture. And then in South Africa, at least, once you've got that, that complete application and the formalities in order, it will proceed to grant. Other jurisdictions are not like this. In other jurisdictions, your, your patent is examined by an examiner. But as I say, this is, just bear in mind that South Africa is a little bit different to the rest of the world in terms of how patents work. Most of the rest of the world, it's going to get examined. Um, and then once it's granted, that's when you get the rights. So it's not it's not strictly true to say that you have no, no wherewithal or rights with a provisional application, but the, you can't go to court with a provisional application. You need to have a granted patent before those rights, um, th those rights can occur. And also, again, and this is more important in the international context, there are costs at each step of the process. So your application, there's a certain amount of costs. Some of them are drafting costs that go to me. Some of them go to the, the CIPC. Um, and then if you're in another jurisdiction, they go to foreign agents, they go to paying for the filing fees over there. And then at each stage of the application process, again, overseas, you'll have examination and there'll be more costs. So you've got to bear in mind that it's a process that has, it has immediate upfront costs and then it has ongoing costs, which carry on after the grant of the patent because you need to renew it periodically. So this all sounds, it sounds like a lot of work to be honest. Um, and then the nature of the right that you get is territorial. 
So in other words, your, your patent rights are limited to the area where you have applied for and gotten a granted patent. If I have a great idea and I apply for and get a patent in South Africa, that doesn't necessarily protect me in China if I do not have, a, if I do not have any patent rights over there. I need to apply in everywhere I want. Worse yet, um, for, the, you know, for the person applying for a patent, it only lasts 20 years. Now, 20 years is a long time, I'm sure you can all agree. But if you look at something like a trademark that can last forever, if you look at copyright that lasts on average 70 years, it doesn't seem that long anymore. And the final thing is that patents aren't necessarily a positive right. It's not the same as trademarks where you have a right to do something. What patents are is they're a negative right. They give you the right to prevent others from doing something. Once you have that granted patent, you can prevent people from making, using, doing, selling, offering for sale, or crucially importing into the jurisdiction where you have those rights. Now, what this means in practice is that it's entirely possible to have a valid patent and be able to take somebody else to, to court for patent infringement, but still not be able to work your invention because you are infringing somebody else's patent because they have that negative right over you. So the, 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 the use of the rights is a little bit less straightforward than you'd expect. Um, if I could just get this to go. Sorry guys, we're having technical issues today, but it's okay, we'll get there. Could we go back like three slides? Yeah. Okay. So, as I said, I've busy been talking down my own profession here a little bit of my own field of, of, of expertise. Patents don't seem that great. Until you realize that the right that you have, the, the result of this fairly slow, expensive process is a strong right. That negative right gives you the ability with prima facie proof that you have that right. In other words, that you can go to the court and it is assumed from the get-go that that right is in operation. And you can then use that right to take people to court for infringement and pull them through our expensive court system. The end result is that this is effectively a legal hammer. It is a large, heavy object that can be used to sort of, you know, swing around fairly violently if you need to. It's not necessarily the sort of thing that you use to sort of do very fine work. And what this tool gives you in a business sense is it gives you a set of, of options that you can use depending on where you are in the market. So effectively for a, an up and comer, especially if you are a small startup firm, what a patent can help do is carve out a protected space in the market by giving you this limited quasi monopoly over, um, you know, over what you can stop other people from doing. And it can also be used defensively and offensively. And I'm going to just take two, two examples that are fairly on the extreme ends of the defensive and offensive ends of what you can do with a patent. So on the, um, on, the, on the extreme defensive end is what you call a patent thicket. This is something that large drug companies like doing, that very large concerns get a lot of value out of. And that's basically where you say, okay, I don't just have a product. I have a suite of products and each one encapsulates dozens of different technical inventions and you've got the resources to burn. So you go and file 50, 100, however many patents you need to, to cover every single aspect of your business. And you basically make it so that anyone entering the market has to either clear this thing through brute force or they're going to start tripping over left, right and center because they might not even be able to go and get rid of one of your patents and before they trip over another one. This is a great strategy if you're a leader in the market because you basically get to sort of put a a protected zone around the entire area that you wish to operate in that only other people who, is e who are equally well resourced can go can get through. So this is a great business strategy. Of course, it relies on the fact that you're sitting at the top of, you know, you're sitting on the top anyway. Uh, let's see. What there we go. The next thing, the, the next strategy that I've seen, and this, this is one that I've actually seen used in the South African context, and obviously I can't give details, but this is what I like to call the mowing the lawn strategy. This is this is a lot more focused and it's a lot more cunning in its application. So what you do is you set up a small patent portfolio. It doesn't even need to be a portfolio of incredibly strong patents because it's not meant to go and fight against your, your immediate competitors. You're not gonna go up against guys who are sitting at the same level you are because they can fight you in court. That you're just gonna grind each other into oblivion. What you do is you set up this patent portfolio to deal with the guys under you. So the, 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 the classic example that I saw was a firm that was in um, it was in uh, digital space, 
And they had this issue that they were an established market player. They weren't the biggest guys ever, but they were established. They had a small patent portfolio and they, had, they constantly had these guys coming out of university every few years and starting little startup firms, which is, you know, it's, it's a worry. You, you've got this existing product. You don't want these guys coming and competing with you the whole time. So what they do is they every few years, they'd wait for this new crop of little entrepreneurs to come up. They'd wait for them to get into the kind of the five-year death zone of a, of a startup business. You know, the point where your costs are highest, but your returns are lowest. And then they'd go and hit them for an infringement. And these guys would take one look at their bank account. They'd go, oh, we cannot afford this. What are we going to do? And then they would either go out of, they'd either move out of that part of the market or they'd pay a license fee. And then it's great, you know, you've now, you've now converted a potential competitor into a licensee, somebody who's now dependent on you. Wonderful strategy. It obviously takes a fairly specific um, set of circumstances to set up. And it's something that is sadly very suitable for South Africa because of the fact that you can set up a patent without necessarily having to worry about the validity until it gets to court. So this is a very extreme example of what I like to call an offensive use of patents, but it's a very clever one. I can't help but, but mention it. I, I can't help but admire the sort of the, the person who came up with it as well, because it wasn't us. We were on the other side of this thing. Um, but but it's, a, it's a very clever use of, of, of a legal tool. Okay, let's see if we're going to get the next slide. Yes. So as I said, these are only two approaches. Oh, no, no. We, there we go. There are many more possible approaches that you can you can think of and what I want to just emphasize again is to start thinking of these things like tools to so start thinking of them in the context of your situation, where you are in the business what sort of market you're in. Because, again, I as a practitioner, I don't want to just go out and just say do patents or do trademark or this is a thing on copyright, I want to be able to help you unlock value and help you develop your business and build your business because it, it's, I mean, I'd like to say it's out of the goodness of my heart. I, I'd like to think it is to a certain extent, but it's also good business for me. There's no point having a customer who shows up at your door, gets bad advice and then leaves. You want people to grow. You want there to be a, a thriving ecosystem around you. Um, the other thing that I'd like you to just keep in the back of your mind is these strategies are not one and done. It's not a case of just having a patent or just having a trademark. It's a case of mixing and matching various different forms of intellectual property to suit your business, to suit your, your strategy. And each of these forms of intellectual property, they have their own, they have their own strengths, their weaknesses, their own uses, their own, their own ways that you go about getting them, and their own considerations that you need to make. Um, one day, if, if anyone wants to come back for the sequel to this, we can have a two-hour discussion on copyright because it is a, it's a mess. Um, well, it's a hugely complex area and uh, it, it deserves its own entire topic of, of this sort. But as I said, the trick is to fit IP strategy into business strategy. Um, for using these other examples, there's no point setting up a patent thicket when you're a startup firm because how are you gonna pay for it? There's no point trying to mow the lawn when you're the little guy and all the other guys are just gonna sit there and squash you. You know, how are you going to defend your, you know, how are you going to offensively use your small little patent when the other guys can just take you to court and, you know, fight, you, fight, you, fight it out with you? Um, there's no point in building a high wall with nothing of value inside. There's no point building a gigantic portfolio of intellectual property when there's no underlying value proposition sitting behind it to back it up. Remember, the product, the service is where the value is. The intellectual property is just a way of backstopping it, of realizing that value. And there's no point having a good idea and then leaving your front door unlocked. So there's no point saying, throwing up your hands and going, oh, it's all useless. The stuff's expensive. It's hard to get hold of. I'm just going to go into the market and just see what happens because at the end of the day, you're not, you're leaving these tools in your toolbox and you're not using them. So this is the, the this is the part that the, all four of you are, you know, gearing up for. This is the data guys. We're getting to it. So the case study that I decided to use was concentrated solar. Again, everyone in South Africa knows about solar. Um, briefly, there are kind of two, two general kinds of solar. There's solar panels, solar voltaic, the thing that you're thinking of where, you know, sunlight hits it and it makes electricity and it's magic. And then there's this stuff, which is where you take a bunch of mirrors, you aim them at something and you heat that thing up. And anyone who's played with a magnifying glass as a kid knows that the sun heats things up very well. And if you put enough of these mirrors there and you control them well enough, you can heat things up to an enormous degree and you can generate serious amounts of power. Normally these things are started out in the desert where there's lots of sun and nobody cares about, you know, property prices are, are cheap. So nobody cares about the, the fact that you've got a bunch of these mirrors everywhere. And the main use for them is in things like power generation. Now, these 
concentrated solar systems are not particularly viable to stick on your roof. They need a certain amount of area, like football field sizes of area. So they kind of, they, they, they're in a bit of a weird use case. They, they, they fit in, in the mix, but they're not necessarily the, the be all end all. They're a bit more expensive than solar per kilowatt, but they ha have a higher capacity factor. That's the amount of time that they can spend running. And obviously they have built in storage because once you heat something up, you can put it somewhere, you know, put it into a, the equivalent of a giant geezer and just keep it hot and then pull it out when you need it. So we've actually got a couple of these systems um, by one of the, the people we're gonna be looking at in South Africa. And I think they're more on the way. Now, concentrated solar in South Africa, well, in South Africa, in the world, is one of these uh, interesting case studies for a person who's looking at the patent landscape. That's in other words, the, the, the data landscape that you can get by looking at patent applications because patents are, they're a good, they're, they're a good subject for doing data analysis because they're filed all over the place. In other words, there's lots and lots of them and they're filed with government organizations who store all the data on them. So the, the government itself is keeping a lot of data that you can then, you know, you can then look at. So we do a lot of data mining using patents in, in, in my firm. And this is the, the sort of thing that we do. Anyway, one of the things that we're used to seeing when it comes to patents in general is kind of a general upward trend. If you're, if you're looking at patent applications over the, over the world, there's sort of a slow upward trend over time. Um, this is not the case here. The general market for, for concentrated solar is actually something that kind of, or general patent, sorry, landscape for concentrated solar, is something that kind of peaked in 2009, 2013. It's been kind of, a little bit of a downward slope since then. You can see that there are a fair number of granted patents, but equally there are a fair number of lapsed patents. Those are patents that hit their 20 years and they're now expired. So, so we're looking at a market where actual investment in technology is more or less plateaued. The technology started to become mature. And, right? This is worldwide, yes. Uh, it seems like we press once and then we get two. Thanks. So this is, this is where you can start looking at your big competitors as well. Um, we've got a whole bunch of, of names from all over the place. Interestingly enough, Spain is one of the centers of excellence of, uh, of concentrated solar. They've gone into it in a big way. And the guys who are in some ways at the forefront of pushing that are Abengo. You can see that they are by far and away one of the largest movers and shakers in the concentrated solar field. Anyway, Eben Go is an interesting, they're an interesting bunch as well, not least because, you know, it seems like Spain has got a lot of sunshine and I think we could learn a lot from that over here. Um, but it's a company that started way back in the 40s. Um, it has kind of become a, it's become one of these companies with lots of different bits, lots of different branches. And it's got a piece of it that specializes in solar thermal. And they've headed up a number of successful projects, including three in South Africa. So good for Eben Go. They're, they're helping us with our own problems. Um, as I said, they, they do a lot of stuff, energy generation, water supply, electricity transmission, infrastructure, and the, all the operations that you need to maintain those things. Can we go? Yeah. And if you look at Eben Goa, they are also, they look like the market in general, which makes sense. You're the biggest filer. You're the biggest mover and shaker in the patent, um, in the patent field. Your patent portfolio is probably gonna resemble the average. Uh, so they also, their, their investment peaked around about 2009. It's sort of plateaued and it's not slowly been declining. This is a sign of a company that has basically set up a big defensive ring and they're now sitting on it and they're going and extracting value from it. And interestingly enough as well, they're not, uh, you, you remember I mentioned that patents are territorial. They've not limited themselves to territories too much. Um, they're doing a lot of work in South Africa. They've got a bunch with us. They're doing work in India. Obviously, they're doing work in Spain. That's where they're located. So that's where they're going to concentrate a lot of their efforts in Chile, in America, in China, um, all over the place. So they've got a big diversified patent ring, the sort of people we'd love to have as a customer, obviously. Um, yeah. Um, as I say, the, the, their, their patent investment basically mirrors the industry as a whole. It also, interesting enough, mirrors the, the company's larger investment. So if you look at the entire company portfolio, it also so, shows a similar trend. Now, the slightly confusing thing about this is that concentrated solar is not a plateauing market. It's not a case where concentrated solar 
schemes kind of plateaued around about 2009. Everyone is just riding the market out. It's actually expected to grow massively in the next little while, which says to me that this is a effectively a mature technology and a big player in the field like this is expecting to ride this thing out with the technology that they have and reap those returns for that giant portfolio that they spent years putting together. And I think they're going to do it. Um, they've positioned themselves as a key player in, in a growing market, but with a mature technology base, which is absolute gold as far as, um, as, far as getting you know, those, those profits up is concerned. And they, I think they're also sitting on a good wicket in terms of the fact that the market and competitor dynamics probably make market entry limited or in market entry difficult. Because you can imagine not everyone can make a startup company and start putting these giant solar collectors out in the desert and convincing you know, uh, governments all over the world to buy into these giant projects. You need to kind of be big to get in there. Um, so effectively, these guys have set up a very good example of a defensive patent portfolio, the purpose of which is to fend off rivals. So in other words, you sort of establish a boundary where you and your competitors are just going to stay out of each other's patch. That's fine. You'll go work in your own fields. Um, and it's also great at keeping new entrants out of the market. So this is, a, this is a good patent thicket kind of thing. And now, having said that it's hard to get into the market, I'm immediately going to jump into a startup who is dumb enough to try. Um, this is a, a bunch called Heliogen. They're a US startup firm. They were founded in 2013, at, as you can, if you recall, at the peak of that investment trend. So I think that there was quite a bit of investor capital sloshing around for guys with bright ideas. The people who started Heliogen are people with bright ideas. It's the usual kind of Silicon Valley, you know, guys from, from very well-known universities kind of starting up these um, very interesting tech firms. They solidly fit into that model. They've got an incredibly overblown um, industry prospectus as well. I mean, can you imagine... Uh, can you imagine being able to say that you're a renewable energy technology with a mission to help industry achieve net zero and that you combine your, so, your, your solar thermal technology with artificial intelligence and all that sort of stuff? That's great. I'd love to have that on my business card as well. And they're also, interesting enough, I had a look at the news. They also do the classic startup thing of they had a, an initial founder who got ousted at some point and he's now come back to try and steal the company back. And they have to, they've had to fend that off. So that's what they're doing right now is they're busy fighting with their, their former founder and they're releasing, um, they're releasing Q1 statements along the lines of, well, we're, we're, ra we're rationalizing, we're cutting costs and we're trying to go to market. So they're, they're at the stage now where they're, you know, they're burning through investor capital and they're on a mission to actually start making money off this. Plus side, it seems like they've secured a couple of sites to do it. Um, I haven't been able to see anything about projects in South Africa, but one can hope. And that's that's a picture of their um, that's a picture of one of their facilities. They're also what you'd call a, a, a small patent portfolio. I mean, compared to the guy, guys like Abe and Go who have hundreds of patents, these guys have 13 patent families, of which nine are granted, four pending. And interesting enough, the two earliest ones are assigned to another company. So obviously they decided to realize value out of that by just basically selling off some of their earlier technology to another startup um, who is willing to pay for it. The other interesting thing about these guys is that they're not like the rest of the industry. They're not showing a declining filing trend. They are showing an increasing filing trend. They are building up a technology base. They are actively filing in various different places. They have focused their, their filings very heavily in um, America, which is, again, makes sense. That's where they're, they're located. That's their home. That's where they're expecting their first big markets to be. Um, but they've got a couple around the world, including one in South Africa. And the focus when you look at their technology is basically on heliostat tracking systems. So the heliostat is that mirror that you see there. That, that's actually what aims the sunlight at things. So their, their big deal is they've come up with what they think is a clever way to make these, to aim these mirrors. Um, and they, th they think they've come up with clever ways to sort of redesign the heliostats and, and get them working. Specifically, if I remember right, to, to produce very high temperatures that they can use for industrial processes. So all this taken together, you can start getting a picture of a company that's a, it's a startup, it's running hard, it's trying to find a niche in the market. And that's this high temperature solar thermal, this sort of thing where it's not necessarily just for bulk power generation, it's for industrial processes that need very high temperatures. Um, you can imagine the amount of things that get made in factories that need 
a thousand degrees, a thousand five hundred degrees. They need burners and all sorts of stuff. You could potentially replace them with solar if you could make your your mirrors smart enough to focus the the energy enough to get that heat out. So they are also you can see that they found a niche. They've gotten to the point of trying to carve out a beachhead for themselves, and they're now going for it. They are burning through this investor capital and they're trying to get those big projects going that's going to pull them up. And I think we'll probably see if you were to, to come back here in five years time, they're either going to explode on the market, you know, start taking over that niche and then trying aggressive, to aggressively expand it to others or they'll, they'll be dead. I don't think these guys are going, they're, they're going one of two ways. Um, anyway, the, it's these two examples, I think they, they give us sort of an idea of where you, you can start applying this toolkit approach where you can start looking at your situation and using what you have to try and realize as much value as possible. Um, as I said, the, the lessons that, that, that jump out to me at least is that your patent portfolio for these guys reflects where they are in the market in this stage of development. A bingo, it's large, it's got a large, it's, 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 it's doing the smart thing for a large company with an established portfolio, an established market base. And equally, Heliogen is in a different position. It can't use the same strategy, but it's working to its strengths as well. So they're both, they're both, they're both boxing clever, basically. Um, one over. And having now sort of given you the good word of, of all that, I'm just going to quickly run through some common pitfalls. Um, and that I just want to keep, I want you guys sort of keep in mind as, as we as we leave this presentation. The number one pitfall is the one I mentioned in the beginning. It's the, the thinking of IP in isolation, the thing that patent attorneys used to do where you come in and they just say, oh, patent. Number two is the need to, or failing to grapple with the requirements and limitations of specific forms of IP. In your business, whatever your business is, you are going to very quickly become aware of the forms of intellectual property that are important to managing and maintaining and growing your business. You're gonna become quasi experts. You're going to become very well versed in these things. And it's important because there is nothing, there's nothing worse than making the classic blunder that just sort of scuppers everything. The classic one for us in patents is there's a requirement with patents that a patent must be novel. And this means that it must there must be no public disclosures before the point that you file that disclose your invention. And the classic failure state for that is, especially, unfortunately, the, the um, academic institutions like the CSIR, I'm sorry to, to use you guys in, as an example here, the classic failure is academics have an idea, they think that there's value, they're thinking about spin out of some sort, but before they're going to do spin out, they're going to go to a conference and they're going to tell everyone about this good idea and they're going to show the charts and they're going to show the graphs and they're going to just wow these people with their brains. And then they go and they talk to the patent attorney and the patent attorney goes, well, you just close this. We can't, we can't patent. It's dead. And then they go, oh, oh, but it, I mean, it's mine. You're like, mm, well, you gave it to the world. Congratulations. You're <laughs> so... And that's not to say that everyone should, you know, everyone should not, you know, immediately just keep everything secret. It's to say... Know, know the different forms of IP, know how they work, know the limitations, know the, the pitfalls and the kind of the pratfalls that you, you need to avoid. It's important. The, the next problem that companies have is the one we've been banging about constantly here, failing to align your IP strategy with your business strategy. In other words, you're a small guy, you look at the market leaders, they all have these gigantic patent portfolios covering absolutely everything and you go, okay, we need that because we want to be market leaders, right? You know, we've got to have what they have, but it doesn't work because you're not a big, you're not a big market player. You can't set up and defend a patent thicket. You need to think where you are, what you're doing, apply the strategy to that. And then the number four one that we deal with, and this is also a problem, is what I like to think of as magical thinking. It's the idea that either this form of intellectual property is a magic shield that kind of will carve out a market by itself. It, it's, 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 it's not a tool, it's this thing that I put out there and then money will just happen. Or the inverse of it is you get burnt once and you go, no, this stuff is useless, we don't need it. I don't want to know about patents, I don't want to know about copyright, I don't want to know about trademark, I just want to do my business, make my products, that's all I want to do. They're both, both bad examples. Again, this is not, this stuff isn't magic. I know lawyers like, I mean, I know it sounds like we came out of Hogwarts or something. We speak a different language, but we don't do magic. Law isn't magic. These are just tools. 
And thinking about them as tools makes it a lot better or a lot easier to apply to business. There we go, as I say, banging on about this, tools, um, intellectual property as tools. Um, as I also said, if, if you guys come back next year, I'll do the two hour, two hour copyright uh, speech and we'll see if there's any copyright left after the AIs have been through with us. And the final one, and I, I mean, I, I'm also, this is where I have to plug myself. Go and talk to uh, uh, go and talk to somebody who can give you professional advice. Go and talk to a patent attorney. Go and talk to a trademark attorney. You don't even have to talk to me. Talk to our competitors. They're all good. They're all very skilled people, and most of them will actually make a consultation for free to go and talk about the initial. Um, you know, your initial consultation is usually free with most of them. Please, 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 please go and talk to professionals early if possible. And that way you can have all the problems outlined for you before you even, you know, before you make those, those first steps and potentially stumble. So I think that's me. This will flick over. Yeah, that's me.